So I, I invite now Jules to take the seat as the moderator of the second panel and me to move a bit as one of the participants in the second panel and also all of the participants and Giovanni to join me here at the top of this table. Okay, well, thank you very much. We are now starting with the second session of this uh, second day of the AI and the Law Conference. Now we have Giovanni Tusset from Bocconi University, who's going to talk about AI and testimony. Giovanni, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot, first of all, for the opportunity of uh, presenting you my, my, my work and apologies for not being there in presence. I, uh, I had a family issue, so uh, I couldn't come. I regret it, but hope uh, I will be able to share with you my, my ideas uh, remotely. So uh, I'm going to um, start by making some points about the use of artificial intelligence in fact-finding. Uh, the process that we see now is the process that has been going from traditional tools like the ones you see in this picture to AI techniques that we use uh, nowadays in fact-finding. And we have a lot of interesting uh, techniques and methods and mechanisms and um, devices that help us in uh, finding the facts in a case, a civil or criminal. I have here a slide with some examples. Um, basically, they concern criminal trials, but of course, we have similar things in civil cases. Um, Consider, for instance, probabilistic genotyping software. That's an AI thing that helps find the, the facts in a case. Facial recognition software, textual analysis to establish authorship of a text or a message or whatever. Driving estimates from Google Maps, for instance, to check alibi. Mm -hmm. uh, surveillance cameras that categorize what's happening. For instance, oh, that's a drug dealing. Of course, they don't say it like that, but that's the idea. They categorize what is seen and eventually communicate that to police forces. In that place, uh, now something uh, bad is happening, like a drug dealing uh, uh, affair, etc. Okay, so that's 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 surprising, of course, because uh, um, I mean, uh, with these techniques, uh, at least in some of these cases, you don't. You have also some kind of generation of new evidence or processing of the information into something new that is used to uh, that is used uh, by the fact finders uh, in the end. Um, so let me try to put things in, in in some kind of order by saying that there are different uses of AI in legal fact finding. This is a kind of list that is uh, uh, helpful to uh, the philosophical mind to see the difference in the uses. Um, uh, one thing, for instance, is to inquire about the case and collect evidence. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. Another thing is to make an analysis of the collected evidence, you get the evidence and you analyze the, uh, the, 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 the content of it. To generate new evidence is another thing that I'm interested in too. Uh, next, to assess the evidence presented at trial or the evidence available. And finally, to decide on the merits given the evidence. These are different things, analytically speaking. Of course, they are connected. Of course, there are relations between them. But analytically speaking, I mean, there are some conceptual differences, at least between them. I want to focus on the third and the fourth item uh, of the list. That is generation of new evidence and assessment of evidence presented at trial. I mean, assessment made not by humans, but assessment made by AI devices or machines or how you want to call them. Um, my first focus is on evidence assessment. This is not the, I mean, this is not new, of course. I'm just repeating things now that have been said in the literature. Um, you can use Bayes' theorem and Bayesian networks more especially uh, today to calculate the final probability of a certain hypothesis given the evidence. And uh, the humans are determining uh, these uh, quantities, let's say. Uh, AI does much better at determining the a priori probability 
of a hypothesis H, that is the probability of H given background information. This is usually done given statistical data that give you background information on which you can establish the a priori hypothesis, the a priori probability of the hypothesis. Next, AI does much better at determining the likelihood of evidence E, that is the probability of E given H. So the probability that you find the evidence uh, that you are considering if the hypothesis is true. And you can also measure the so-called likelihood ratio that gives you the probative value of the evidence. I'm not going into the details of it, but those of you who are familiar with the Bayesian theory understand uh, uh, very easily what I mean. And finally, AI does much better than humans at determining what we call the a posteriori probability of H, that is the probability that H is true given uh, the evidence, the evidence that we collect. Uh, humans make errors. Uh, as Burkhardt just said, there are systematic errors that we make in that, and AI does much better, so that's helpful. Still, there are some problems. We can discuss them maybe in the Q&A at the end. But th there's a lot of literature on this. Bayesian networks are, um, I think, uh, uh, the interesting thing in this context because they are artificial intelligence based uh, systems of uh, yeah, calculating probabilities mm -hmm. with the problems that come along with them. Now, once assessment is made, once the assessment of the evidence is made, um, you go to decision in a case through standards of proof. So standards of proof can be taken as the evidentiary thresholds that tell you when the burden of proof has been satisfied. So if you reach the threshold or go beyond the threshold, you, you prove what you had to prove, and so you are entitled to a decision in, in your favor. Traditionally, standards of proof are given a qualitative formulation, for instance, beyond a reasonable doubt. That's a qualitative formula. The phrase doesn't tell you that you have to meet a number or a numerical threshold. That's, you know, that there is the idea of um, a reasonable doubt, which is not entirely clear. Uh, and then people discuss what do we mean by reasonable doubt, etc. Mm -hmm. Now, given the problems that affect the qualitative formulation of, uh, of a standard like this, and given the increasing use of um, methods of uh, assessing the probability of evidence hypothesis through, for instance, AI systems, my impression is that there is in, in the present world an increasing tendency to adopt a qualitative formulation of the standards of proof or to suggest that we would need to quantify to some extent the standard of proof, which is a problematic task. Uh, for the criminal standard, of course, because you don't know exactly what your threshold should be. I mean, 90%, 95, 99. Well, there are methods of saying, well, um, according to, the, the, well, the, this value the, or this utility that you attribute to false negatives and false positives, so respectively, you can measure blah, 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 blah. It's controversial. It's controversial, but still, I think that uh, given the probabilistic assessment of evidence and hypothesis, especially with the Asian network, we are going in that direction, which has uh, problems. We can discuss them later. Now, the more specific thing that I want to address in this presentation is the use of AI with respect to testimony in, in trials, civil and criminal. Um, again, again, AI can be used to assess given testimony, so to assess testimony given by humans, by human witnesses, but it also has a role in the generation of testimony. This is more surprising. This is the new thing that we need to discuss, I think. As Burkhardt just said, there is also an interesting use of AI that I have not covered in my presentation, which is the um, use consists in enhancing human um, perception or memory, as he said, which is an interest, a very interesting thing, but I won't address it in, in, in my presentation. Now, the uses of AI in assessing given human testimony. Um, what do we do 
uh, in, in that in that sense. Well, the idea is to establish, for instance, the reliability of a, of a testimonial source, W. Uh, that is traditionally made with our intuitions about what we take to be a truthful person or a person that seems to be sincere, and, and etc. Of course, these are intuitions that are based on our experience of the world or experience of particular context, knowledge of our fellow human beings, uh, our attitudes, and blah, blah, blah. But there are, there are, of course, biases in that, and we are prone to make errors. So the idea is that AI may score better at that. Still, I find this very, very problematic. I think that there's a lot of research to be done uh, on that. Uh, sometimes you hear a claim like this, the source is 70% reliable. Come on, what do you mean? I mean, I, I'm always puzzled by those statements because they need a, a lot of work to be specified. I mean, for instance, uh, David Shum has made a, a, an effort in that. It's not the only one, of course. But there's literature on this. Literature on this. I'm giving you this example for the purpose of our discussion. The idea would be to have some uh, uh, measurement of uh, properties of uh, a testimony or properties of a testimonial source like uh, uh, the veracity of the witness or truthfulness uh, first. The second is the objectivity of the witness, hmm? the capacity of the witness to report, see or report objectively the things at stake. Uh, and finally, the observational sensitivity, sensitivity or accuracy of the witness. Now, I'm not going into the details, but you understand that this is not an easy task, of course. And when you are told, well, the source is 70% reliable, you wonder what that means exactly. And, and not only that is, is the problem. I mean, uh, once you have determined in some way the reliability of a testimonial source, your job is not done. I mean, you have also to consider the credibility of the given testimony, of the specific content that is given as a testimony, which is not exactly the same thing as the reliability of the source. These are two analytically different things. And I, 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 I think that uh, we, we still don't have a model, maybe I'm wrong, but we still don't have So there's work to be done, definitely. Um, now, what are the advantages and drawbacks of AI assessment of human uh, testimony? Some advantages are, are listed here. Uh, first of all, the efficiency of the process. That is an aspect that you find in, in the literature uh, very often. Uh, of course, it is clear that it's time saving. Um, so it's efficient in that sense. There's no fatigue of the fact finder, so the AI um, system or, or device can assess how many testimonies you want. There's no fatigue problem as you have instead with human fact finders. Um, secondly, which is another aspect very much discussed in the literature, there are no biases in the evaluation of a specific testimony. That's great. I mean, the AI system is free from those kind of uh, problem, uh, from that kind of problem, because there's no impact of sex, race, age, profession, etc., uh, of the source of the testimonial source. Hmm? When the AI system does the uh, the evaluation, uh, evaluates the source, uh, it simply applies the algorithm. Uh, let's, let's say so. There's no specific impact of those. Uh, factors in the assessment. But, as everyone knows, there are possible biases in the algorithm uh, themselves and in the starting data that the, the machine is given. So the problem disappears from the uh, phase of the application of the system to specific testimonies, but it, you find it again in the, in, in the input, in the starting uh, uh, phase of the process, I think. Another, another problem, made a mistake. Okay, another problem is the opaqueness of reference class 
choices. This is a bit more technical. We have a, 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 a slide that explains it a little bit. The idea is that in order to uh, make an assessment uh, according to AI uh, systems or devices, you need to select exactly your reference class with, res with respect to which you uh, consider data. Consider this example. Uh, it is called in the literature the reference class problem. Again, the question is the one I was mentioning uh, earlier. What does it mean to say that a source is 70% reliable? You know, I, I really, sorry for repeating it, I, I'm puzzled. Every time I read things like this, I'm puzzled. What does it mean that? First interpretation. Well, in all possible conditions, source tell, tells the truth seven times out of ten. Hmm. Or, more specifically, in all accident conditions, so not all possible conditions, but conditions concerning accidents. Huh? Imagine it's a civil a, a, a mobile accident, for instance, and W is the witness. In all accident conditions, the source tells the truth 7 out of 10. Hmm. Or, in all night accident conditions, the source tells the, tells the truth uh, 7 times out of 10. Hmm. Or, in all night accident conditions, giving rainy weather, etc. So you know, you know what I mean now. I mean, what's the reference class? And where the data come from? Well, maybe we have statistical data, that's fine, but what's the reference, cla reference class and how the data have been collected? So these are all problems that we have. I'm not going to say that they are unsolvable problems. They, are, they, they, can, be, they can be handled, but uh, you know, it's not an, an, an obvious uh, thing uh, and solutions to these problems are not obvious. Uh, the other thing I want to mention now, which is the pretty new frontier, I think, of the use of AI uh, with regard to testimony, is what is called in the literature machine testimony. So the testimony given by a machine, I mean, sorry for using the machine metaphor, but it's used in the literature, and I'm going to follow that idea. More specifically speaking, it's the issue of AI-generated testimonial evidence. It's not collection of existing information. It's not assessment of existing information. It's generation of new information. Generation of new testimonial evidence, to be more specific. How that is possible? Well, it's possible, first of all, if you understand that there is a difference between information stored in a device and presented as evidence typically pictures or messages stored somewhere. And the second, uh, another thing is the information generated by a device, generated by an AI, AI system uh, itself. Hmm? And if something like machine testimony really exists, is the result of machine learning and questioning also. Machine learning, machine learns, generates new evidence and possibly answers questions that are made uh, to the machine to, to understand how the machine came to, to the result, uh, how the result uh, can be, can be uh, understood more specifically, etc. Et there are questions uh, about that. That's the new frontier, I think. It's very interesting and also problematic uh, from a legal perspective, as I will try to show. Uh, I'm relying on work in particular made by Andrea Roth from Berkeley. She's a scholar that has published several papers and, and works on what she calls machine testimony. I think it's fascinating work. I'm referring to her. Uh, this is an American, American case that she has uh, mentioned. I've found the original decision and I I think there are very interesting issues in this decision, not only from an AI perspective, but also from a legal perspective. And the case is like this. Uh, it has to do with the, uh, some events occurring at the border between the United States and Mexico. Uh, the case was decided in 2015. 
and Mr. Passiano Lizarraga Tirado was arrested and charged with legally entering the U.S. He admitted, the defendant, that he was arrested in a remote area with mountains near the U.S.-Mexico border, but claimed he was arrested in Mexico while awaiting his instructions from a smuggler. So it was an illegal action by the police, given that, according to him, they were in Mexico. An officer, a U.S. officer, testified that she used a GPS device to determine their location by satellite, and then inputted the coordinates into Google Earth. And that was the result. You see the map? You see the coordinates? They were there, according to the machine, and you see below where the border is, United States and Mexico. So they were north to the border. They were in the U.S. So the arrest was not illegal. Well, okay, it was in the U.S. Hmm? Interesting. The map uh, show was claiming that's evidence generated by a machine, right? By an AI system, if you dislike the word machine. So Google Earth placed a digital tag, they call it like that in the, in the opinion on the map, labeled with the coordinates indicating that the location lay north of the border. Defendant claim that, and now comes the law, which is interesting. Oh, that's hearsay. Wow, very interesting objection. I mean, the defendant claims it was hearsay, and then, and that means, according to uh, U.S. law, it was an out-of-court assertion offered for its truth. If it was like that, it was inadmissible, according to uh, U.S. law. I'm not going into the details of that, but let's take for granted that if an assertion is an out-of-court assertion offered for its truth, then it's hearsay and therefore it's inadmissible unless some exceptions obtained, but we leave it that to one side. Now, the Ninth Circuit, uh, it was Judge uh, Kosinski, acknowledged that the digital attack was a clear assertion. Wow, th this, is, this is puzzling. I mean, I don't know what you think about it. The digital tag was a clear assertion, not only an assertion, but a clear one, such that if the tag had been manually placed on the map by a person, it would be classic hearsay, classic hearsay. It wasn't classic hearsay. It was a machine that made it, that put the tag. So it wasn't classic hearsay. Still, it was a clear assertion. So was that admissible or not? The court, in the end, rejects the argument of the defendant, and they say, well, machine assertions, although raising reliability concerns, are simply the products of mechanical processes and therefore akin to physical evidence. Ha! Huh. So, was that correct? I mean, the Google Earth tag is considered an assertion, but it's not hearsay. It's an assertion, it's a clear assertion, but it's the product of mechanical process. It's AI generated, it's mechanical, so it's akin to physical evidence. It's an assertion, but it's also physical evidence. I mean, that's weird. That's weird. There seems to be some tension or even contradiction in this opinion. I'm curious to know what you think about it. Now, the, uh, I'm going to towards the end. If you have machine generated testimony, not, not only machine-generated evidence in general, but machine-generated testimony, uh, you have a black box problem, of course, because normally you, you don't know how that happens. You don't know normally how that testimony, if we call it a testimony, is generated by the machine. What are the algorithms, etc.? What, what, what's the mechanism? What's the procedure? What's, what are the steps with which the mechanical testimony or AI generated testimony is produced. So there are some safeguards for machines, for machine testimony um, that legal systems can adopt to mitigate the problems, to mitigate the black, black box problem in particular. For instance, it can be protocols that are established, operation protocols that uh, the systems might, uh, the system should uh, implement and follow. 
you can have pre-trial disclosure and access rules so rules that give you access to the to the, the, the methods or say or, or the mechanisms of the relevant systems you can have auth authent authentication and reliability rules courtroom testing rules, corroboration rules, and jury instructions if the trial is a jury trial. I'm not going into the technical, into the details of, all, of the, these different safeguards. Of course, they depend on the kind of um, procedural system that you, you refer to, if, if it's a jury trial or just a, a trial with a judge. Um, the, so depending on the kind of trial and the kind of procedural system, maybe some of these safeguards are more important than others, and maybe there are more safeguards, not only the, the, the ones listed here. Uh, I want to focus on number four now to conclude my presentation. Point four above, uh, above is about courtroom testing rules. So rules or principles or your mechanisms, to speak metaphorically, that have to do with testing evidence, uh, checking the evidence and its value. And uh, one, one important thing that can be mentioned here is the Sixth Amendment to the US Constitution that says that in all criminal prosecutions, remember this applies to criminal cases, in all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to be confronted with the witnesses against them. There are similar provisions in other constitutions. There's a similar provision in the Italian constitution, for instance. There are there's similar law, uh, similar law at, at the level of uh, the EU system. And I guess that many, system, many systems had similar uh, rules or principles. Now, what is the confrontation that you can have with an AI device? I mean, how do you confront a device? How do you confront Google Earth uh, or Google Maps, uh, producing information that is given as evidence. Uh, I mean, th the risk is that uh, you don't really have that opportunity that you have with human witnesses, of course, and you don't have the opportunity either of cross-examining the AI device, or maybe in the future there will be some possibility of that kind, but it's to be designed, we have to wonder how to do that. It's a safeguard in criminal trials in particular. Uh, the AI-based uh, production of evidence is that you are given evidence that you cannot check, you cannot cross-examine, you cannot confront uh, the source of the evidence against you if you are a criminal defendant. And that's bad for the fairness of criminal proceedings. Mm -hmm. Um, so, summing up and concluding, uh, there are different uses of AI in fact finding. Users of AI can uh, regard evidence assessment and also decision making. Uh, there can be AI assessment of testimonial evidence, um, which has its own advantages and drawbacks. There's, and this is, I think, the most interesting part uh, now. Uh, AI generated testimonial evidence. If you take things like Google Maps or Google Earth as systems that make assertions, and there are legal issues about that. Well, if there are assertions that can be hearsay problems, uh, there's a confrontation problem if you have in your legal system something like the Sixth Amendment of the US Constitution, there's a cross examination problem. How can you cross-examine an AI uh, source? And the new frontier is uh, whether we can and how put questions, ask questions to AI devices. Uh, to what extent we can ask questions to devices and get answers, uh, which can be evaluated in order to make uh, a decision. I'll stop here. Thanks for your attention and for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Giovanni. Uh, for time constraints, I will collect the questions and then you can answer the collective questions. So who wants to? Okay, please.
Thanks, yeah. R really interesting. Quick comment and then the real question. Um, there is an, a precedent for um, non-human intelligence uh, statements and how to treat them in court, and that is sniffer dog evidence. Where the sniffer dog gives a signal there's drugs in, in the consignment, as the handler interprets it, and that's the same problem. We don't know what happens in the brain of the dog. We rely on the interpretation by the handler. It is a type of assertion, woof, <laughs> but it is treated uh, as if it were physical evidence. So there is a precedent um, for, for the handling. Um, my real question, though, is um, when it comes to the quantification and the burden of proof, um, Larry uh, Lorden wrote, um, it's, it's beyond reasonable without reasonable. And part of that analysis was to show really strong evidence, and I think different jurisdictions have the same finding. We are willing to convict on much, much lower evidence in a shoplifting case than in a murder case. Uh, we factor in the severity of the punishment. Everyone does this. It's not what the law says. The law doesn't distinguish it, but there is no legal system that puts as much effort in a shoplifting conviction as it puts in a murder conviction. Now, if we were to move to the sort of vision that you describe, where we get an objective quantification of the evidence outside that context, um, I would say we would probably convict, uh, acquit pretty much all low-level criminals and convict many, many more uh, people accused of serious crimes, would be my guess. Um, would we want that? Um, or, or is maybe AI pushing us here into recognizing that what the law prescribes and how the reality of the courtroom works are totally irreconcilable? Because as humans, when we say, am I convinced the guy did this? Uh, I already factor in uh, the consequences of a false positive or a false negative, and I just use different standards for, okay, that's a fine um, or a slap on the hand, two days with an uh, electronic tag at home versus death penalty or life imprisonment. Thank you very much. Is there is another question? Please. Uh, thank you for the presentation. It, it was fantastic. I thoroughly enjoyed it. So uh, the definition for machine testimony, uh, in the second part of it, it says uh, information generated uh, by a device uh, uh, could also be deemed as an evidence. So uh, my question is, uh, we have a deception detection test, test which is polygraph, narco analysis, brain mapping and uh, other, other lie detectors. But uh, we have a U.S. Supreme Court judgment which says that uh, at least the polygraph and narco analysis at least uh, uh, is not allowed. So uh, would your definition uh, is synonymous of the test that I just uh, mentioned? Any other question? Okay. Can you please turn off your microphone? Okay, it is not working. Okay, any any other question? No? So, Giovanni, the floor is yours. He can hear you, right? He can hear me, yes, of course. Can you? Should I answer now? Yes, yeah, so yeah. sorry, we are still There's having problems there. with the microphone. Okay. Uh, I, I wasn't able to, to, to hear everything that was said, unfortunately, for, for the bad connection, but I got, if I got it right, I want first of all to thank you for, for the suggestions. Um, first question, I guess it was Burkhard. Uh, um, uh, yeah, thanks for the dog example. Yeah, that, that's 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 um, that's interesting. That's uh, an analog to to the case I was presenting, uh, with the difference, uh, I'll guess that. Uh, you cannot really go into the mind of the dog, into the brain of the dog, as much as you can go into the AI system that you use to generate the result. That, that's the intuition, I mean. So you can check what happens with your AI system more than you can check what happens uh, in the brain or mind uh, of the dog. 
what are the legal consequences of that? Well, we should think about them. Now, no, I don't have an answer now. No. But thanks for the suggestion. The second point, I totally agree. I mean, um, if you just put one threshold, one numerical threshold, let's say 0. Uh, 0.95 uh, probability as the conviction threshold for all possible criminal offenses, uh, that would be too rigid, I think, and that will have uh, the bad effects uh, that you that you were going that you were were suggesting. One solution would be to leave things as they are presently. That is to leave uh, the standard as a qualitative standard, giving some qualitative qualitative idea of what the threshold is, with no specific. Uh, specification of the probability uh, measure that is required for conviction, and then leave uh, decisions uh, to the discretion of fact finders. But, well, that means the status quo is what is best to have. We, we cannot improve things by giving a quantified version of the standards. But, of course, we can use AI methods to give numbers to fact finders that will eventually consider in their discretion if those numbers are sufficient for a condition. Of course, there's discretion. Of course, there's no specific uh, indication of what the threshold will be, but maybe this is better than have a quantified standard approved. Uh, in civil cases, things are less problematic because uh, you know the usual idea is that the standard is the balance of probabilities or preponderance of the evidence which is more easily translated into a probability value I'm not going into that on the polygraph that was the second question uh, on the polygraph uh, is it ai is it akin to ai generated uh, evidence it's not i mean the idea is that th that system is not as sophisticated as ai systems that we use now and those that we will use in the future uh, the problem is with the polygraph is that it has an impact on uh, uh, the, the human being that is tested in the assertions uh, you, you check. Uh, you, you want to find the the. You want to check the veracity or the truthfulness of the person by measuring, you know, some bodily reactions of the person. And, and the problem of the polygraph, I think, is that one that you that it, it's a sort of invasion of the threat to the dignity of the person was bodily reactions are measured with the polygraph or, or similar system. You don't have that problem with AI generated testimony, at least in some of the cases that I have considered for my presentation, like the Google Earth thing. You don't have a, a, a something that is a threat for the dignity of the defendant. Uh, so it's AI generated evidence that avoids that problem. Does it make sense? Thank you. Yeah. Well, yeah. Okay. Oops. I feel like I have a microphone. Can you switch it? Yes. I can't hear you anymore. I don't know if you hear me. Check yourself. Oh, microphone. Build the models and seeing how what kind of impact it has on uh, law and legal practice and individuals, but. Uh, the reason that I am maybe qualified to talk about this topic is like we built a system at some point called Ulysses. It doesn't work very well, but uh, it's a system that predicts court decisions. And I wrote a book, my PhD dissertation also, <laughs> on, uh, which I shamelessly plug here. It's open access. You can find it <laughs> online. The reason I am shamelessly plugging it is because we put a lot of effort into making it available to lawyers for lawyers to read. So it's, it's quite a technical book, but it's written in such a language that like if you're interested in machine learning and and uh, how it's applied to case law, for instance, that's that's maybe uh, a good a good thing to look at. Uh, so and today I'm going to be largely talking about this this paper that 
haven't come out yet, but you can still find it online already uh, <laughs> on predicting court decisions. Uh, so uh, in the book, uh, before we already looked at the systems that were available about at the end of 20, well, I think uh, around 2021 and up to and including 2021, this is the systems that we analyzed. And in the latest paper that we wrote with uh, Pauline McGwright, uh, we analyzed uh, more than 100 papers that came came out in the last 10 years. So, uh, but I want to today to go through this field of legal judgment prediction and talk about some issues that are uh, there in terms of how the research is conducted. We'll discuss in general what what it means to predict court decisions. And then uh, I want to take you through a journey of how this field has been developing, where we are now. And it's a, a spoiler alert, it's it's a sad story. <laughs> uh, so, uh, and you can follow the, the presentation and try to figure out where the sadness starts. Um, so uh, let's start from, from uh, what uh, we discuss, uh, well, I discussed in my PhD dissertation is, we looked at the time at 27 systems that came out that claimed to be predicting court decisions. These are the systems that uh, covering not so many courts, uh, the majority of the systems uh, talk about uh, predict decisions of the European Court of Human Rights. The reason that most systems built, are built for European Court of Human Rights is that European Court of Human Rights publishes all their case law. So a lot of decisions, like, <laughs> let's start the sentence. Uh, a lot of decisions uh, that are made when developing legal tech systems are based on the availability of data. So that means that if, if uh, some country uh, publishes case law, especially if that case law is in English, that it's much more likely that something will be developed than for, for other languages. Uh, so here, a lot of systems are European Court of Human Rights, especially uh, this year. I think all, in, all of these systems are European Court of Human Rights. All of these systems are European Court of Human Rights. Uh, this is French court, German court. So a few, a few more, uh, a few of Turkish uh, courts uh, Tur uh, Turkey publishes a lot of their case law online as well, and they have also a growing community in computation law. Uh, so back then we uh, we looked at these systems, and um, we also saw at what kind of performance metrics they report. Uh, they perform very high accuracy scores. Not all of them. Uh, <coughs> A lot of systems would perform something 75% accuracy, but there were systems that even uh, reported 100% accuracy. And you see 100% accuracy in any machine learning system, you should start questioning things at that point. This just, it just should not be happening. Uh, just because the system operates on large amounts of data, that means something probably, uh, the way they evaluated the system, something probably went wrong. So. This, this was already concerning. Um, the way that we did the research back then, we uh, looked specifically at um, cases that predict decisions in a somewhat binary manner. So for European Court of Human Rights, there will be, uh, the decisions will be uh, whether there was a violation or no violation of human rights. That's kind of the systems that this system are like. It can be more than two, but it was this classification problem with uh, multiple labels. That's, that's kind of what uh, they were predicting. And what we ignored back then is also a lot of Chinese uh, research that research Chinese uh, legal system, uh, which were predicting charges of the, um, the they were pre instead of this binary classification, they were predicting, for instance, uh, the lengths of prison term, things like that. So back then, we, we it, it was just not in the scope of our research, but in reality, there's much more research out there that, that does that. Uh, they also uh, report up to 99% accuracy, uh, really, really fantastic systems. Um, but uh, we see all this academic research that comes out, uh, but yet we don't really see many systems that predict court decisions. Uh, it's been happening for quite a while now, since uh, 2015, there were every year papers that are coming out that are predicting court decisions, and yet, we don't see them anywhere. Law firms are not using them. The courts are not using them. Nobody is using them. So 
uh, today we're going to try to see why. Why does it happen? Is it is it because people are afraid of it, or is it there's something in the in this those systems itself that doesn't allow them to be used? So, a very shallow dive <laughs> into how those systems work. Uh, a normal system will use a, a corpus of data uh, which contains case law. So, European Court of Human Rights publishes all the judgments, we'll take all the judgments and use them for, for predicting court decisions. So the, how it's normally done is that this is, for instance, a, a case. This is what a European Court of uh, Human Rights court case will look like. So there will be some sort of section information. That's information about who the judges are, the date, some basic information about the case. There will be a um, procedure section that not always, but often this is the steps that the applicant to the European Court of Human Rights took uh, to get to the European Court of Human Rights, so domestic remedies often. And, and then there's facts of the case that describe what actually happened to the applicant. And then there's often, well, always, there's a law section, which is arguments of the court. Then there's the verdict, which is just the decision itself, whether there was a violation of each article of the convention or not. And sometimes there's dissents and opinions. And what those systems usually use is they take these facts and they uh, feed that into the machine. And they, based on those facts, they try to predict court decisions. So the way that the training of the machine uh, will work is that those facts will be taken apart into words, combination of words, sentences, paragraphs whatever the, dis the design of the system is, then it will be represented in the form of some sort of vectors. Uh, it can be a complex calculation decided what, um, how it will be represented. But in, uh, in practice, it will be a string of numbers that will represent certain information that was in those facts. But what it represents is really the words inside that text. Um, there's some illusion that can represent meaning, but in reality it just represents words within the text. So, and then what the machine learning does, and this is how machine learning used to work, still often performs uh, better than the neural networks. This was what we used to call traditional machine learning, which would be uh, all this, uh, well, these facts from the cases would be represented in a multidimensional space. Here we have it in a 2D space. And then we would try to build a system, try to literally a mathematical equation uh, uh, that would separate these uh, facts into the ones that fall on one side that would be, for instance, violation of human rights, and the ones that fall on the other side that, the, that showed that there was no violation of human rights. And the idea of machine learning is try to separate it in the, in the best possible way that they are as well separated as possible. So this is a linear it's a picture of a linear classifier. It doesn't have to be linear. It can there can be some sort of squiggly line. Um, lately, th this is a representation of neural network. Instead of uh, separating in lines, you'll go through some sort of steps and end up at a certain um, a result as well. This is what. Uh, Transformer uh, pre-trained GPTs that look like. So it can be a more complex thing, but in, in reality, it's the same sort of process. You feed in the text and it processes it, it com comes to a certain um, conclusion. Um, so, and the idea is that you've trained it uh, on enough words, and the way that you try to separate those words is by saying, okay, some of these words are more uh, often used in decisions that end up in violation, and the other words are more often used in decisions that are in no violation. This way you can separate the things. So then once you've trained the system to look at these words and say, okay, these words are more important for violation cases, these words are more important for non-violation cases, you end up with a system where you show it a new case, new facts of the case, then you can make some sort of educated guess on what, or whether it was a case with a violation or not. And this is, in principle, how all of this system work that, that predict court decisions. Uh, the problem is, and this is where we start with the sadness, is that <laughs> they use the facts of the judgments that were published by the European Court of Human Rights or any other court. Sometimes European Court of Human Rights also has it in a very structured way. 
other courts will have a bit of a mess of, of these sections. But what it uses is the facts of the case. And there's a few problems with that. Uh, with that. First of all, in the legal proceedings, there's no such thing as a fact. Well, we can <laughs> maybe uh, also continue on the previous talk. But there is, uh, the reason that people ended up in a court is they dispute the facts. Uh, this is, um, so they have some, some sort of perspective when they think this is applicant to the European Court of Human Rights, who think, says that their rights were violated, and the state says, no, we didn't violate any rights. This is why they ended up in the court. So there's no such thing as facts. Second of all, what this do we what we did is we took these judgments that were already published. Those judgments at the end, as we discussed, contained a verdict. Those judgments already have a verdict, and those facts are actually uh, not. It's just what a judge decided should go into a judgment. These are not the facts that existed before the the proceedings started. This is, and a judge, uh, they write a story when they write a judgment. This is a very specific selection of, of facts written in a very specific way. In the European Court of Human Rights, judges don't really write any of this, but <laughs> whoever wrote those uh, judgments chose to uh, describe in a certain way. And they also chose the facts that really correspond to their uh, decision. So if you're an applicant to the European Court of Human Rights and you want to predict how those how your case will go, you don't have those facts as such. So you cannot make a predict your system is not trained on the same uh, data that an applicant to a court will have. Therefore these these things don't e actually exist at the time of the prediction. So what those systems do instead of predicting what the judgment will be it predicts what the judgment was, because it, it could only do it for the for the facts, for the judgment that already has a verdict. And if we want to know the verdict of the judgment that already came up, we could just read the judgment. The verdict is right there. <laughs> why would why would we <laughs> do any of this? Um, there's a lot of work that does it this way, and I wanted to be very open about it. I'm, I'm not without blame here. I wrote a paper that I know some people read and it's very popular. Uh, I don't think it's uh, completely discreditable. It's just, I think that our experiments are still interesting, but it has nothing to do with predicting court decisions. I think this is very important. If you use the facts of judgments that from the judgment that were already, already have a verdict, you are not able to predict court decisions. Um, it's not to say that it's not possible. As I mentioned, we have the system called Yuri Says, and what we use for the European Court of Human Rights is we take still not the documents that are uh, available to the applicant before the proceedings, but this is uh, we use so-called communication cases, which um, basically when the applicant um, applies to the court, uh, for some of the cases, the court will uh, write a summary of the application and communicate it to the state that is a potential violator in order to inform them that there's a case and ask some questions. It doesn't happen for all of the cases, but for the ones that it does, we can train a system and make predictions. And then those people who are already in the proceedings can, if the system were to work well, which it doesn't really, uh, they could make a decision on whether they would proceed with a court case uh, and up in the friendly settlement or something like that. So, so it is possible. And um, what we've seen uh, in terms of performance of the systems that when we compare, uh, and this is the paper in which we did this experiment, is that when we compare uh, prediction uh, using uh, data that is available before the judgment is made and those facts in the judgment, what all these uh, papers that have 99% accuracy report, uh, that the, the results are very different. And um, the reason that we did this experiment in the in the original paper that I'm now quite critical of uh, my own paper is that we actually talked to people at the European Court of Human Rights, uh, and they said, okay, the, these facts are the same as the facts in communicated cases. That they are just they copy paste them in the document, and then the judge will write um, uh, their argument or 
whoever writes the arguments will write the arguments of the court. Um, and we, instead of, uh, uh, you should trust and verify, we just trust it. Uh, so, and what we found later uh, is that if you take, um, so from uh, communicate cases, the summary of facts, and from judgments, we take everything out and just take the facts, and we take all the same cases to train and test our system uh, so it was, this will be summary of facts and the facts from the judgment. And if you look at them, they look very similar. I, I'm afraid that maybe you're a bit far away, but I can show you that these sections yeah. are more or less exactly the same. Yes. And then all of a sudden, this is even a serpent case, how relevant. Yeah. Uh, uh, you start uh, noticing there's a few little things that get into those those documents. This is a communicated case, which has a little bit more information here that ended up in the facts. Here in the facts of the judgment that there is, for instance, some justification for why um, some of the documents were not submitted in the beginning. Before it still said that they were not submitted, but here it said since she had been ill, it could not retain a lawyer earlier. So very little things that should not... Uh, if you read that, it's not factually that important per se. Uh, very often, but nonetheless, you see the text is a little bit different. And then when you um, uh, build the system, uh, so this uh, this is uh, a Halkida system that also predicts uh, for European Court of Human Rights, so they would get like eighty two percent F score. Hundred is good. <laughs> they would get uh, eighty two, uh, or like even eighty three point six. But then when we did this uh, with the European Court of Human Rights, when we use this final judgments. We would get 92% accuracy. But when we use the same cases, but just facts from communicated cases, so this pre, pre uh, trial data, we would get 67 as the highest. And we tried. We tried to make it. And this is also, this is the more traditional, much simpler system. And these are all the language models. They also didn't perform as well as you expect them to, to do in today's world. Right, so it's a really, really uh, different uh, approach. So a lot of people are saying uh, now that okay, when, because I've been on this mission for a long time, explaining to people how this 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 doesn't work, and they say, okay, we're going to develop the systems on the data that we have available and this facts of the judgments, and when the other data comes along, we'll just apply those methods. But this is a demonstration that it might not be true because something that does work. On, on the final judgment does not necessarily work for pre trial data. So when you see any system that predicts court decisions, and to be honest, I work now on a broader scale, a lot of legal tech is developed like this. So especially if you see high, high performance, question, question everything. Uh, but here, here the, the problem really comes from the data itself. And we can, we can discuss on how there's biases in the data, there's all kinds of problems with the data, but we didn't even get to predicting court decisions yet. We didn't even get to, to the system that does what it claims to be doing. So it's, it's maybe even a bit too early to say, well, we can always talk about biases, but for these systems, this is, we really have to take a step back before we um, talk about other stuff. So yeah, basically, the message is you cannot use final judgments. So anytime that you see that somebody used the final judgment, this is also the, the story in the commercial. Uh, world, which is mind blowing to me because they have to sell the systems afterwards, but they're not doing what they claim it to be doing. But what you could potentially be using is, for, for instance, submissions by the party, some, some data that is available prior, could be even uh, judgments of a lower court. The problem is that it's likely they will not perform as well. Uh, but what we are advocating for is okay, let's, let's step, take a step back, let's do research that performs not so well and slowly. Uh, do better research then we'll eventually uh, get somewhere. So you do still need the judgment, so you would have the label to train the machine learning systems. But, uh, um, so this is the, the story that we had in 2021, uh, so in, in the middle of 2021, and out of those systems, only three were actually predicted court decisions. So using this data, that is available prior. And uh, two of them are mine. So 
so this is a this is what we found uh, in 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 the book. Uh, today uh, the world looks like this. There's 171 papers that we found, and uh, since this is information in September of 2023, since then I think at least 15 came out. Wow! Uh, so I have a Google alert for them. Uh, so and that, and out of 171 papers, can yeah. you see it? Yeah, only 12 actually predicting court decisions. And the scores here are so, so much lower. The systems that I considered successful and even got published would get 57% accuracy. Mm. Right? This is... This is sorry, in a binary... Just remember, everyone, yeah. these are binary. If you just toss a coin, you coin get 50 yeah. 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 So, like, the message here is it's... What we're trying to do when we're predicting court decisions is we're trying to predict the future. And the message here is predicting the future is a hard task. Uh, uh, and so now there's 12 systems. That means there's very few courts uh, that are covered uh, in the outside of, like, for instance, for Chinese uh, case law, where there's so much work coming out. None of the systems are actually predicting court decisions. Um, there's a lot of buzz around it, but not, it's 7%. 7% and more than 100 of these papers came out in the last three years. Um, so this is, this is really where we are as a legal tech community is, is moving. Um, so why does it happen? Uh, very shortly. Most papers say that when they develop the system, they will be useful for legal professionals. And at that point, they, they don't say anything else about why would we need a, a system that predicts court decisions. So there's no real um, understanding of who's going to be using it and why they're going to be using it. Uh, so they just go into this, they have this data and they build something shiny and it gets published clearly. A hundred papers in the last three years. Also at the conferences that should really have better reviewers than that. Uh, and um, so what we are suggesting is that um, once you understand who your, your end user is, and this is like what our paper is really about, um, once you understand who is going to be using the system, then you, uh, by just thinking about the application of it, uh, you're much more likely to build a better system. So if you're thinking, okay, I'm building a system for uh, an applicant to the European Court of Human Rights. What kind of data does uh, applicant to European Court of Human Rights have? Is that the data that I have available? If it is, then let's try and then we'll have like, much more considerations. But this is the first point. Applicant of European Court of Human Rights doesn't write their text in English. <laughs> they write their facts in their, in their uh, native languages and they describe it in a much different way than the court does. Okay, let's say I am I'm building the system for applicant who already applied. And we have these summaries. Okay, now we can build the system. If we're building something for a law firm, the law firm might have more access to data. They might have submissions by the parties. There we also have to think whether we're allowed to use the submissions or not. But nonetheless, you can, you can think of, okay, who is going to be using that and what data do they have? And can they use it? And then we can build the system. So this is a general recommendation to uh, how to proceed and what we should expect from the systems in the future when we, when we uh, examine them. Um, so uh, th this problem is really uh, accelerated by the fact that there is a lot of these data sets, they're called bench da uh, benchmark data sets that are published, um, which is really just an epitome of the shiny data. This is uh, the research, they will publish a data set and afterwards people don't even look at the data. They will just use that data set and try to prove the models instead of really understanding what they're doing. This is why there's so much more systems now because you can have this data set and if you uh, got a performance higher than the previous guy, then you can get it published. That's the whole thing. And uh, this kind of uh, ways can often accelerate research. So there's this um, shared task. It's uh, sort of a concept in NLP where people... Um, uh, basically compete to get the highest score in, in a competition at a conference, which can 
uh, facilitate research in a way that uh, a lot more people will work on it uh, and try to really, there's a competition spirit there to get the best system. But if the data there is wrong, then what you do is you produce all of a sudden at this conference 20 papers that don't do what you expect <laughs> them to do. So this is, uh, um, it's really would have to be quite a, <laughs> why I call it a mission is because there's so much work that comes out in this field that is wrong. And there's so much established work and there's so much, and so many of these established competitions and established data sets, but none of them are actually doing what they are doing. So it's, it, I sometimes feel like a very small voice in a very big ocean. <laughs> um, so yeah, as I said, the, the solution would be really to, to <laughs> encourage people to really yeah. think about what the systems are for and who the end user are. Um, so yeah, uh, to conclude, what we, have we learned today? That uh, predicting the future is firstly very hard and uh, we see it from the experiments that are uh, conducted on, on uh, papers that um, use data that is available prior to decision making. And another, another lesson here is that we nowhere near where it seems we seem to be. There is all this, also newspapers, articles about robot judges coming uh, and uh, whatnot, all, all kinds of uh, media and papers and, and this illusion that we are in the world where the tech has gotten us here, but we're nowhere near it. And, and my, my educated guess is that it's the same in a lot of other uh, fields in legal tech. So this is, this is just an example. Um, which I, I, I know a bit more about. Uh, so, yeah, the message for community and, and for us as a whole uh, is like we can either, this is generated with Dali, uh, <laughs> and, uh, we can either continue like producing this, this research that is, to be honest, is a waste of money. It's a waste of, it's... Uh, a lot of projects were funded on, on the idea that they're going to be predicting court decisions and they did produce this. And uh, or we can, we can step back all together, say, okay, you don't need to get 99% accuracy to get published. You can, because we are so much further away from that. If you get 58% accuracy, but you can t say something about your data and actually conduct proper research, that's, that's good enough. Let's let's start moving from from there onwards. Um, so I hope I hope I didn't uh, depress you too much. <laughs> uh, but it's uh, uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Masha. Uh, for time constraints, I will also collect questions. I have already two words. Okay, I have a bunch. So let's start with Boyan. Quick question. Yeah. So what is worrying to me is not so much that the algorithms can and the systems are not predicting uh, future judicial decisions. And my uh, concern is with the previous research. So it's wondrous to me that every one of the previous research didn't have 100% accuracy because they were predicting basically past decisions. So I would expect 100% accuracy. And I, I kind of have a solution to, <laughs> or an answer to the question in my mind, but I would like to hear you. Why do you think you didn't like hit 100 or 95% every time when you were doing this with the facts of the case? Thanks. Marco? Uh, yeah, thank you very much. I mean, I, I didn't know about this 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 whole in industry, and I think you you. I mean, I don't know. I I, I think I learned a lot. Uh, just a couple of, of suggestions, perhaps on on ways to move forward. I mean, the big problem it seems to me is is that uh, you guys are trying to predict without causality. There is no causal claim on what causes judges to. Uh, make the decisions that they do, and unless you have a claim on that, and to have a claim on that, you have a model. You need to have a model. You need to have experiments. You have, you know, a whole bunch of things that perhaps uh, you know you can uh, contribute to, but it's a lot more. Then you're not predicting anything. I mean, you're just correlating stuff. Yeah. You know? 
And perhaps even though in the prediction sh 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 uh, scenario, once it's understood that this is not causal inference, um, and even in the scenario of the description of the cases, uh, of the facts of the cases by judges themselves, perhaps, that gap between the description of the facts in judgment or in the communication, that perhaps could be useful if it's presented in a systematic way in terms of cues that allows us to uh, understand how judges try to present the case in the best scenario for the argument that the, then they're going to make. And once we have identified those things, then perhaps we could go and try and study uh, what are they picking on. If, if, if you know that there might be something interesting there too. I mean, even even in the just prediction and just description of the facts uh, scenario. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. We have two words there, so you can decide the order of the the questions. Thank you. I really love the remark that there is no facts here, because I think what we somehow forget is that those are all cases where on the both sides, the councils decided they have a chance, right? So if you wanted to build a system, you would take into account all those cases where the council advised the client, either the state or the human right infringee, hey, we're probably going to lose it, right? So like, we're trying to train a system only on the hard cases where, you know, it is a flip of the coin, no? Yeah. And that goes very much in the same direction. Um, I think there's another factor why the research is done like this. Um, to the extent that they talk to lawyers at all, they talk to academic lawyers. And the way we teach students, if you think about it from an ML perspective, is totally odd because we teach students on the basis of high-profile hard cases. Yes. That is like trying to learn football by seeing video clips of the worst fouls in the game. And then from this, you, you, you now try to infer what the rules of the game are and how you play football. Yeah. That, that never, for me, made any sense. And, and there are older papers. I don't know if you considered them, but the Lesnikov split-up system, back from the 1990s, didn't do binary task. It tried to predict um, asset allocation for um, family courts divorce cases in Australia. They use 20,000 cases. Uh, all of them is a really, really similar fact patterns. Not like in the European court where there's huge variety in the cases. Very, very similar fact patterns, huge number of cases, and the audience was a lay person who wants a rough idea how much will that cost me. Um, the evaluation was not as rigorous, I'm afraid. They simply then asked uh, practicing lawyers, here are some scenarios. Would you agree, broadly speaking, with what the system generated? But for me, that always looked like a much, much more sensible approach, because you you train with the actual data, is you train on, the, on, on where the patterns are to be expected. Uh, and that is because humans learn different from law students who already have a lifetime of experience. And, and, and the, 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 the court decisions are just a fine tuning. So for me, that would be the thing. Why, why on earth try to, to use the highest appeal courts where mm. two highly qualified lawyers already agree there's an issue mm -hmm. versus repetitive court of first instant identical fact pattern uh, cases? OK, we have the two last words, brief, be brief. So, Pedro first. Hi, uh, thank you. Thank you, Masha. That was, that was very interesting. I'll be very brief. Um, just one thing, I, I keep reading those papers and they keep advertising percentages. Like I had one here that said 79% and it's, it's, it's like a beauty contest. But the thing is, uh, I, I, and I want to reinforce what Marco said, I, I I think you guys are not focusing on causality. You could focus on causality maybe by developing a model, taking into account like a report of attitudes of judges, but you would need to have profiling on that. And just to, just to finish off, uh, we can speak about it later. I mean, it's not just, maybe it's not 50% because the European Court of Human Rights usually says it's the discretion of the state, but it's so so much easier at the European Court of Human Rights. If you went to the Lisbon Criminal Court, you have like 
I mean, five percent of chances of getting the the, the decision right. Yes, I, I would just like to uh, ask you. Uh, so, uh, you said by the end of the day, we realized uh, it's only kind of a prediction of the cases that were already so prediction of the cases that were sold. So. Can we uh, qualify then the research in any meaningful sense? In, uh, is it kind of a, at least ex post facto assessment of how much of a legal certainty can we get, or how much of a, uh, how much of the I don't know started diseases can we get? I think it it would be so. so if, you know what I mean. What, what, uh, what Burke had mentioned is obviously when you when you have cases with a similar facts, then you can even without predicting but saying okay, we just tested how much of the consistency and coherence in the decision making uh, was done by the by the court. But here with the different uh, facts of the case, so uh, how can we qual qualify the the whole research? In? this was not the prediction in the proper sense of the word. Okay, I, I'm going to combine some of the answers just in <laughs> the interest of time. Uh, and uh, some of them, I think, cover uh, similar things. Uh, but first, uh, boy, answer, why is it not 100%? Uh, so, and this, I think, answers some, some of the other questions as well, because uh, in reality, what the, the judges don't really think that the facts are as important as the argument. So the facts actually might not necessarily cover everything. They uh, So if, if the system is trained on facts, uh, they, uh, the judges will then, uh, in in the law part, uh, of, will specify different things and and elaborate on it. While the facts are, are written often again by somebody else, and and uh, even though there's like some selection, but it's not it's not what they focus on. They focus really on on law interpretation or, or convention interpretation or convention and so on. And this is again, this is just a description of facts. It's not really facts. <laughs> it's it's just this text uh, that so. Um, so I also, yeah, I think that like you could, uh, technically say, okay, uh, if we use the facts that we can predict, uh, the, uh, the verdict from it doesn't mean that the facts really like correspond to that verdict. And, uh, the reality from what we see is that it can be so and it, and sometimes it's not so. It really depends on the court, but it's not, I don't think it's, it's a good way to measure that, uh, to be honest. Uh, it just, yeah, it found some pattern in it and it, it, it can predict uh, this verdict very well, but I don't. So I think those systems, and this is why I think that the paper that I criticize, our paper that I criticize is still somewhat valid is that it's sort of suggest that based on these systems, you can still try to find factors within uh, the facts that sort of make an influence at the sort of um, try, try to see what uh, factors are important for the judges uh, to make a decision, like sort of what, what they decide. <laughs> uh, there was a few questions on causality. And uh, this is, uh, it's, it's, I can give another talk on that. Uh, so I think that uh, it, it comes back to what, what are you building the systems for? Like whether you need this causality or not. So basically, if you, it could be that if you just want to know what the verdict will be, you don't, you just need a system that, if, and you built a system that predicts with 99% accuracy for some reason, then like, let's say, right? Uh, like it, at that point, it doesn't really matter how we trained it, what went into it. If it does it very well, then we have a prediction. Because again, we're not trying to make decisions based on these predictions. What, everything we're trying to do is to predict the future, right? So then the question is, if you want to use it to understand the judgment, if you want to use it to prepare your case, if then then you might want to have an, a more explainable system. I, I, I can admit it and in my talk, I recommend the, the paper as well, where we talk about the fact that uh, yes, there, there are like now ways to generate uh, legal reasoning and stuff like that. And then there's a lot of questions about that as well, because they also generated post factum very often, like you first generate the prediction and so on. Uh, but uh, so, and, and 
we would love to use the data that uh, has like has some information about the the causal <laughs> effects there. But generally, we don't have it. I have to also point out that when people use facts and labels to train the system, that means that the system has never seen a, like especially with the European Court of Human Rights has never seen a single law. It has not seen the convention. It only seen the facts and it only seen the label. There's absolutely nothing there. Like nothing that relates to law. It's, it, it basically like the, what the system does, it tries to infer the, the law from, from the facts, which is ridiculous to, to a degree. But like if it can, great. Then if it can, we also can study why can it do it? Like is there, is there some system, like is there a system there? But, um, in reality, what we have is usually at, at the lower level of submissions by the party, maybe it's decision of a lower court and so on. And there, um, can have some information, but when you use this machine learning system, they, they just really find patterns. So there's no, it's correlation, it's all correlation. But the fact is, like, it really depends on what you're using for, whether you need the exp like the explanation that are grounded in law or not. Uh, and then, like, it could be that you don't, and that's fine. <laughs> um, I don't, I, I feel like I've very briefly somewhat covered everything, but uh, uh, if not, then uh, I'll be here at coffee. So, uh. well, thank you very much, Masha, for the presentation and also for this answering of the many questions that were posited. So now we have Miodra Givanovic and Boyan Spych, and I forgot the title. On artificial reason and artificial intelligence, testing the legal reasoning capacities of LLMs. The floor is yours. Thank you. Just uh, I wanted to suggest uh, that uh, since the coffee and tea is already here in the lobby, maybe you want to get some and uh, return to the room if that's okay with you. I mean. It's getting cold, so I'm just uh, yeah. suggesting that as a possibility to to grab coffee yeah, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and tea and return back. And we'll start a bit later. Please sit here. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. need, I need to... to yeah. Let me open the... I'm so sorry to interrupt these fascinating conversations, but we are like one hour <laughs> behind schedule. So now... We are going to have Mio Dragovanovic and Boyan Spych from the University of Belgrade mm -hmm. talking about artificial reason and artificial intelligence, the legal reasoning capacities of GPT-4. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Jules. Uh, as you can uh, probably uh, hint from the very title of our presentation, we start with a very, very famous... Uh, uh, debate that was uh, between the Lord uh, Cook and uh, the King of England uh, in which the question was who should have the final authority to decide uh, cases in the then England in order to defend the stance that uh, it's the authority of courts and uh, no other uh, no other authority uh, Cook provided the famous uh, uh, saying in which he praised all the uh, capacities of the king that he is uh, endowed with a, a marvelous natural reason, but what he still lacked uh, was the artificial reason and judgment of law, which is necessary for deciding uh, legal cases. So the thesis that uh, legal reasoning is somehow artificial reasoning is obviously due to the very word artificial here of our interest. So what is artificial about legal reasoning? Uh, we came with uh, two possible readings of this claim. The thin reading of uh, uh, Judge uh, Cook is that there is nothing specific uh, that is artificial about legal reasoning per se. It is the ordinary natural reasoning as applied to legal cases, but in order for one to become acquainted with it, one is required to have long study and experience. 
the the thick version uh, would uh, say that uh, some specific contextual features of legal reasoning, uh, including the fact that it presupposes long study and experience, make it artificial enough uh, so to be distinct uh, uh, distinguished from the ordinary that is natural reasoning. To be clear, uh, there are no uh, big practical uh, differences of the thin and thick reading uh, of the thesis. It only makes sense uh, in the context of our research whether thin or thick uh, reading uh, is more relevant for the artificial uh, intelligence uh, 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 type of reasoning. So uh, I hear, uh, we here follow the, the uh, uh, Fred Schauer and Barbara Spellman uh, kind of division between two camps, one as skeptics who favor thin and the other as celebrants who favor a thick uh, version of the reasoning. And basically the arguments, I will not go into detail. Uh, Larry Alexander and uh, uh, Shervin are uh, in the camp of, of uh, skeptics. They argue that there is nothing uh, peculiar about legal reasoning. It boiled down to what they considered as three types of natural reasoning that we have in everyday life, which is moral, empirical, meaning discovering the meaning of words, and deductive reasoning. Whereas celebrants, those arguing uh, for a thick version of, uh, uh, of the thesis, especially uh, uh, Bickenbach, uh, argues that legal reasoning is, first of all, embedded, which means that it's embedded in institutional, substantive, procedural constraints, what count as a good legal argument. And it is dynamic, so it's not so much about uh, the formal aspect, whether we can reconstruct everything through the uh, kind of formal logic. It's more about the, the locus of the reasoner, of its role in the entire legal game and what are the kind of specific uh, duties of that position. I add here uh, Fred Showers uh, also claimed that legal reasoning is odd, even though he's more than, he's in between uh, thin and thick, uh, so in between skeptic and uh, celebrant. Uh, basically, he said that dominant feature of legal reasoning is can be seen as a route toward reaching a decision other than the best all things considered decision for the matter at hand, which makes legal reasoning uh, odd and in a way uh, different. So there are things that are uh, here obviously uh, part of the agreement between the two camps and the things that are disagreeing uh, uh, in uh, between them. And let, let us first list those things that are uh, point of disagreements. So there might be claims that there are forms of reasoning which are specific to law, which do not exist in everyday reasoning. Then uh, it may be that uh, some forms of reasoning are more common in legal than in ordinary reasoning. And finally, some forms of reasoning might be more valued in one reasoning than the other. But yet again, there are some points of agreement. Uh, the first of uh, all about the fact that legal learning and training are vital for developing reasoning capabilities in law. Since we were speaking about training systems of uh, artificial intelligence, it's obviously important to see whether there are matches in these training processes. And uh, the second thing is that reasoning in law uh, requires becoming familiar with distinctly legal material cases and decisions. Uh, obviously, we may discuss as a separate topic uh, whether thick uh, thesis stands. Uh, for our purposes, it's enough that there is agreement at least on these two points. So we kind of uh, take the thin version to be justified enough to be our starting uh, point. So the emphasis on the long, long study and experience. Uh, more specifically, education and practice in law are needed for the following purposes. To identify factual, interpretative, qualificatory, and final decision problems. These are basically four types of reasoning which we combinedly take as legal reasoning. So 
reasoning with facts, interpretation, qualification of the facts, uh, and making final decision, which uh, probably also includes the, the relevance of analogical reasoning in law. Then solve the problems by reaching a decision based on legal rules and principles. Uh, and in the context of our discussion, the question that we are asking ourselves, can artificial intelligent tools effectively substitute the required process of legal training and expertise? That is, can they generate equally reliable outcomes as the ones that are products of the artificial re legal reasoning. Uh, in that respect, let me just briefly mention, we will uh, focus on uh, chat uh, GPT, which is uh, short for, I mean, I don't have to, to read you all this, you know, that this stuff, that's, uh, that's really something that, uh, uh, that is here in this audience uh, irrelevant to, to say. So, uh, it's a reasoning engine, or so we uh, usually call it reasoning engine. Uh, there are some uh, uh, studies that focus on specific uh, types of reasoning. And what we were interested in is to see uh, when we put uh, uh, GPT-4 in legal reasoning and test it in, in the context which are relevant for legal reasoning, what are the results? So... Uh, we take the, the results of uh, uh, two such tests. One is a law school admission test and the other is uniform bar exam. And here are the results. I mean, I will skip also for the sake of brevity this, uh, what, what is LSAT. I suppose all of you know, uh, know this. So G, uh, GPT uh, 3.5 scored in the top uh, 60%, whereas... GPT-4 scored in the top 12%. That's obviously a huge improvement. And the same goes for the test, which is used for the bar uh, examination. We see that uh, the standardized score in the uh, 3.5 uh, GPT was uh, 213 out of uh, 400. And now we have almost 300 out of uh, 400 which obviously uh, tell us or indicate something about the capabilities of the these large language models to reason, or we'll see whether they reason at all or, or just uh, give the pre pretense as if they are reason uh, in, the legal, in the legal setting. And now I leave the last... Uh, the, 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 the rest to, to Boyan. Okay, so w what is important is to, um, we are philosophers of law, and of course we were interested in the topics that we identified as important. So we didn't conduct any systematic t uh, testing. We basically, what we try to do from this perspective of artificial reason and artificial intelligence is to try to notice whether um, GPT-4, and we tested it on a May 24th version now, it, we conducted and wrote a paper a couple of months ago. Uh, there have been some studies since then published, but I'll comment on them at the very end and um, and uh, argue that they don't show much in terms of legal reasoning capabilities. Um, basically, uh, we used one-shot prompting. That means that everybody knows what it means. For those who don't know what it means, it means that no input was given prior to the prompt. So they were the GPT was just working uh, with the prompt that we uh, gave it, uh, and we use step by step prompting, which should be more far more successful than uh, the the usual prompting or the natural completely natural language prompting. Now there has been a study published recently that. Um, legal syllogism prompting makes or gives some of the similar results to step-by-step -step prompting, but the results haven't been haven't been uh, so much different. So I didn't feel the need to update the presentation with this. Now, the prompt, the prompts, and uh, actually what we try to do is we try to notice whether GPT makes this difference between ordinary reasoning and legal reasoning and to argue something from it, to check whether 
uh, legal reasoning is replicated by the reasoning of, of the large language model, at least this version from May 22. So the prompt is rather easy. Please act as a judge. I'll give you the facts and the relevant legal rules. Facts. Boyan was driving 90 kilometers per, per hour in Oisad. The only applicable rule is driving speed in populated areas can't exceed 50 kilometers per hour. Reason legally step by step, reach a decision and provide detailed justification for each step. Uh, this is the the output. Now, now what, what is to be noticed here is that without prior prompting, actually GPT does a very good job of separating the issues in this case. So this is a thing that can be done. Uh, so the, it first tries to determine the facts, then it determines the applicable law, then it applies the law to the facts, identifies the legal issue in this case, and it's a zero-shot prompt. It's hardly conceivable that this is the procedure that it was kind of trained on, and eventually make the decision. So, in conclusion, based on the available facts and the law stating the driving speed in populated areas cannot exceed 50 kilometers per hour, Boyan would be held liable for violating the law. Now, the best way to go about figuring, and this is a philosophical way to go about because nobody in legal practice actually uses it, is to change um slightly just slightly the facts and change just slightly the law what would or what we think that the, this slight change of facts and this slight change of law uh shows us it's very and it's a lawyerly um it's kind of a lawyerly ability to detect these really slight changes in circumstances and slight changes in legal text that can lead to drastic differences between two decisions. And it's something that we teach students, and at least, I need at least four years to teach them this. So, yeah, I just changed between Novi Sad and Belgrade. So that's the only change in the prompt. Now, the, the facts are the same. So... A key legal issue that arises is whether the area between Novi Sad and Belgrade can be considered a populated area. This determination is critical as it directly impacts the application of the law to the facts at hand. However, given the information provided, we cannot definitely, definitely classify the area as populated or unpopulated. There is reasonable doubt concerning whether Boyan violation of the provided tra uh, traffic law, as such, Boyan would not be held liable for violating the law. So not only it identifies the change in factual circumstances, but it also, in this case, reaches a decision based on a concept that I never used, but of course was in the training data, which is the concept of um, a burden of proof or reasonable doubt in this case. Okay. So third, interpretative reasoning. The only applicable rule is driving speed in populated areas shall be reasonable. So we're giving... But again, it, it's in Novi Sad, not between. It's in Novi Sad. So the, the, the default prompt is the prompt from Novi Sad. And it knows that Novi Sad is a populated area. So And we expect it to know this, to not make a blunder about the population in the cities. Now... What becomes the problem is, again, correctly identified by GPT. So the problem is now the term reasonable is subject to interpretation and typically requires more context to make a firm judgment. And it says it cannot be confirmed uh, beyond a reasonable doubt that Boyan violated the law. So it uh, works with the basically essential contestability, if I really want to be precise, of the term reasonable and uh, claims that the decision cannot be reached. So, I insist, solve the interpretative issue and reach a decision. And it uses something akin to, again, legal reasoning to decide on the reasonableness of this case. Driving at a speed of 90 kilometers per hour in a populated area could likely be considered unreasonable, as it may potentially jeopardize the safety of others, including pedestrians and other drivers. 
Generally speaking, a prudent driver would drive at a significantly lower speed in a populated area to ensure the safety of all road users. What is important to me in this case, since we made this difference in the beginning, it's never in this conversation defaulting to ordinary reasoning. So it's always sticking by its guns of the re legal tools and re legal reasoning that is used. Now, um, so these tests that Neodrag didn't go into very much definitely demonstrate uh, strong human-like reasoning capabilities of GPT, but LLMs, obviously, the reasoning capabilities of LLMs are kind of a metaphor. Um, there is no real thinking, reasoning, on a, or understanding in any sense that is done by animals, all animals, including, including humans. Somebody connected. Oh. <laughs> AI entered the chat. No, it's basically uh, Anna's Anas the chat. He has ruined the system. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, and now it's recorded. I think that based on these simple tests that are not uh, anything alike developing like this new legal bench system that should be developing uh, a system to uh, evaluate the legal reasonings or the legal reasoning capabilities of AI. I, I wish them all the luck in this world with, with the system. But I think that just from isolated cases and noticing these fine uh, distinctions that we largely de derive from philosophy of law, we can reach some conclusions regarding the reasoning capabilities of uh, of LLMs, or at, at least, Giovanni can't hear us, or at least reach some tentative conclusions available for further testing. So definitely, when asked to reason legally, GPT, at least GPT-4, outputs answers that take into consideration the fact of a given case from the perspective of given rules, avoiding as much as possible, consider, uh, 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 avoiding all things considered, decisions and conclusions, which are usually thought to be a characteristic of ordinary reasoning. Now, it identifies both factual and interpretative problems that arise from problematic descriptions of facts and problematic formulations of norms, and when confronted with a duty to reach a conclusion, even though facts or, or, or legal texts are underdetermined, GPT bases the determination of facts or texts on the qualification or interpretation relying on general principles that are commonplace in contemporary legal systems. Now, this of course doesn't mean the GPT-4 is capable of legal reasoning, but it does mean that it's very well capable of acting as if it reasons legally. Mm. While, strictly speaking, it's incapable of legal reasoning, it can't generate these outcomes that are starting to, to become kind of uncanny. Okay. Uh, Excuse me, guys, there's no audio anymore. Uh, it's, it's muted. Now? Can you hear us now? Yep. Joy? Great. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, uh, so basically, the second thing is the thing that displaces the question almost completely whether it will like replace a judge. At as things currently stand now, what is definitely needed to achieve the best possible results by any of the models is what has been concluded in numerous studies now, everybody is basically publishing a paper weekly, inventing new prompts that are better for certain tasks. Now, I, at the, when I was writing this, the, the let's think step-by-step step prompt was the best, was the state-of-the-art prompt. Now somebody is claiming that the legal syllogism prompt is the state-of-the-art prompt, but in the US they obviously don't use it because they don't don't want to have anything to do with legal syllogism. They don't do formal logic, according, <laughs> according to them in the US legal system. So the more worst is in kind of this artificial legal reasoning, a human prompt feeder or a prompter is 
the legally more reliable is the output by artificial intelligence. So basically they are still very, very interconnected. Let me just see if I can, oh, okay. So, and just some points for further discussion and we'll be discussing them hopefully in the paper. Now, uh, the first is this mm, expectation of perfection bias that I want to tell you about because I think this is the most important thing when we discuss and deal with artificial intelligence. My idea here is the development of self-driving vehicles. Self-driving vehicles are actually doing a very good job. It might be that at the moment they're doing an even better job than humans, but the standards for evaluating the job that self-driving vehicles are doing are way higher than standards for human drivers. I mean, what we usually expect is 100% of functioning of autonomous vehicles, no uh, no accidents, no um, situations in which the artificial intelligence doesn't do a good job. I think that something similar is happening in the, uh, with the advent of LLMs. We are kind of expecting this artificial intelligence to be, at the moment of its inception, as good as legal judges. And we're asking the questions wrong. We're always asking this question whether the artificial intelligence can replace completely and displace of a human judge. The question is, in a way, senseless. In certain ways, it will be able to do it quite soon, but it, but in other ways, it kind of lacks uh, the, the abilities to do so. That brings me to another point, why I think this expectation of perfection bias came about. Uh, I, AI and law researchers in the last 20 years, definitely in the 90s and the, in the 2000s, focused on this idea of algorithms that could be fed with facts and could be fed with text so we could output perfect legal decisions without bias, without uh, kind of logical fallacies and so on. But we got something completely different. We got not a logical machine, we got a language machine. The wondrous thing is that it can output language perfectly but makes lapses in logic now, we couldn't do this with previous generation machines and probably a combination of these two, like uh, uh, an algorithm controlling the results of the one artificial intelligence controlling the results of the other, could produce someone be somewhat better results. But I don't think that we have recovered from this idea in which like logic algorithms, logical algorithms should be fed facts and cases in order to produce judicial decisions in a logically consistent manner. Now, and of course, the third thing is a thing that's kind of like commonplace now is this thing that we usually call the black box effect. And everybody's making a, a big deal out of the black box effect in, in, uh, in artificial intelligence. They're making a big deal out of it mostly because kind of in certain applications, the black box effect could endanger us or could endanger societies and humanity, but not really in the field of law in a way. And I think also that Marsha's research, even these critical parts of it, uh, show this in a way judges have always been black boxes. We have been working on biases, on fallacies, on attitudes, on psychology, on social psychology, of, of decision making, but we are still not uh, in possession of a causal model of judicial decision making like, like Marco mentioned earlier. So that would be it. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. Again, for time constraints, I will collect the questions. So who wants to start? Please. Really interesting and, and yeah, fascinating how much it could do. There was one thing that struck me though, uh, the way you interpreted its response to lacking data, mm -hmm. where it used uh, suddenly rules of procedure. Mm -hmm. They were not quite correct, were they? Uh, but what seemed to happen there was an almost a leftover of the old closed world assumption. If I don't know something, no one knows this, or it is unknown, and on that basis, the decision is made. But you would not normally say, oh, it is not known if the 
road between Belgrade and mm -hmm. uh, is, 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 is rural. Therefore, the rules of um, uh, in dubio pro apply, and, 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 and there wasn't a proof taken. You would simply say, well, can you please give me that additional information, or you would put a judicial notice. So, so I found it quite interesting. There's a really old AI problem, the closed world assumption, sort of resurfaces here, and it camouflages as a procedural question, but I don't think it gets it quite right, in most contexts at least. What the, so we thank you. Thank you. Check it uh, or check do you want to collect? Yes. Uh, is there any more question from now? Giovanni? Marco? And then Giovanni. Um, yeah, just... Um, One uh, following step could be to see whether you can manage, you know, principles and kind of find the law. This is something that, you know, law professors do supposedly, I don't know, in the United States, the Socratic method, you know, kind of embarrass the students with the farther consequences of deciding in one way or another. You begin with a fact pot pattern, they have an intuition on what is the right decision in that case, and then you modify the fact pattern in a way that if they apply the same rule, then they will have embarrassing consequences. And I wonder if that is possible at all with the, because I, I'm not, I mean, it, be, it seem odd to think that they have normative intuitions, but certainly you can plug in a principles so and a kind of open-ended norm, you know, and, and then try to, to see whether uh, what it does with changing the fact pattern. Thanks. Giovanni? Yeah, thanks. Uh, great presentation, guys. Um, I think that to make your point even stronger, one could say, I'm not entirely sure, but one could say that uh, with hard facts, um, the system proves much less proves to be much less satisfying in its results because right, if if a case it's really a, a hard one you need some kind of creativity to find a solution to assess the new issues that come up with a new hard case and the system the ai system even i mean getting information from uh, already decided cases maybe is not able to come up with a satisfying decision if the case is really new, if there, re if there are really challenging new issues, and at that I think that humans remain for the time being uh, much more uh, better as decision makers. That's the intuition. I'm, I don't know if you if you agree. With that. Yeah. Can I uh, I, I actually I had two questions. One was <laughs> the same as Giovanni has uh, mentioned, but the other one is just a sort of a comment on the uh, black box uh, comment. Uh, is that I think the the problem there is that the uh, judge is a different black box than the machine is a yeah. black box, and so there's no uh, and so the machine might be very systematic in some mistake that is marginalized to somebody that the judge might not be, for instance. Uh, so and then people might not want to have that. Or, or the other way around, the machine can be very random uh, in, in some things that you also might not uh, want. So it's, it, it goes both ways, but it, I think that the, the mistrust is there is that like, we can't, we can't uh, with the judge, we can at least sort of sympathize and, and like, imagine how they might be thinking of the machine can be, uh, yeah, that it's just very different. Mila? Mm. I'm interested whether we can use ChatGPT in the future for asking legal questions before going to the lawyers. Because, for example, in Serbia, um, law lawyers are asking for money even for first-time conversation. And uh, if and since their uh, services are really expensive, maybe in the future we'll be able to use ChatGPT prior to going to the lawyer to see whether we will have any chances on the court. So do you see any space for using ChatGPT for those purposes? Okay, I think that we have enough questions, so please.
a rundown to the questions in a re- re- reverse order. Mike, well, Mike. Uh, I'm Mila. I'm absolutely team robots. There's a team team humans <laughs> and team robots. I'm team robot. And this and this is a yes and yes. It will be I think sooner than we might imagine. The answers will at times be wrong, but not way off. Not insanely off in the sense, yeah, you should, I don't know, do what. They will be off, and but yeah, human uh, legal advisors are off for different reasons. Might be for different reasons. <laughs> okay, uh, Masha, and this is the second question in reverse order. Um, Humans are, it's dubious to say whether the GPTs or these generative AIs are wrong for reasons, which, because reasons imply rationality and stuff like that, and you really can't, there is, there is, and I will, I will talk about that a bit in the second presentation, there is quite a bit of a difference between something that we can call procedural rationality, which is, how we arrive as as persons, as reason, uh, rational beings, to conclusions, and something that we call output rationality. In principle, something uh, something can be output rational in a sense, and we see that dramatically with LLMs, without it being procedurally rational at all. And we'll have some, at least one example of that in the reasoning of uh, LLMs in the second presentation that Jules will do do with me. So they are d- different uh, black boxes, but it eventually boils down to just kind of we feel more at ease when a judge is doing something. So he enacted a penalty because he's racist, and but we know people get racist. But why would so, uh, an AI enact a penalty like this? And we have a long way to go, and it's technical work to to understand why this has preference over other things. So, but but I think if enough money is invested, for example, in mechanical interpretability, at one point, at least half the money as as mu- half as much money as we invest in in large language models, somebody will figure it out. Then, Giovanni, <coughs> um, I, Giovanni, uh, it's not. For me, for, for for example, it's not really insanely interesting having like hard cases discussions with GPT. I kind of lack the possibility to yell at it. I mean, I can yell at it, but <laughs> like it doesn't make any it doesn't make any sense. And you yell I'm, at yeah. No, not really. Okay. I yell at, yell at you when we have this. I wanted to compare you to ChatGPT. Because you treat me as an artificial intelligence. No, I, <laughs> I treat you as a human intelligence. And it kind of, when we have a car, hard case or discussion about a hard case, in the heat of this discussion, you say something. For me, uh, I had the, these discussions with, with GPT-4. And I suggest to everybody to have these hard case suggestions. I'll put some of them on the presentation. It's it's a very good idea. But the nuance, for example, in moral reasoning is stunning. I don't think that you can get that nuance from, uh, let me not say percentages, but but from the majority of persons who are actually who are actually humans or pretend to be humans, so it's basically what I wanted uh, to show in this case are just these small things regarding legal reasoning. Reasoning with principles is one of those cases, because usually it involves some moral considerations and balancing, or proportionality the way we do it. Uh, I was doing it, it does a fairly good job of reproducing the, the... this balancing reasoning with varied results in terms of giving weight to, to certain things or to others. But yeah, thank you for the suggestion. I think it might get um, get um, might become a slide in the in the next presentation. And finally, uh, it doesn't get it right. <laughs> it doesn't get it quite right. And this is the, this is the issue that I was like. What what does get quite right? The identification of the burden of proof thing when we when we have different facts. Yeah. Uh, my so uh, and this is 
kind of my deal with this thing that I invented, this, this expectation of perfection bias. I, it, it, it doesn't get it wrong in an interesting way, a pattern way. Sorry, yeah, the, the, the point was not that it gets it wrong, mm. that's, that's trivial, but it got it wrong in an interesting way, a specific pattern, and the pattern seems to be a really, really old AI problem, and that is uh -huh. a closed world assumption, and that it smuggled in a closed world assumption into ah, okay. and, and dressed it up as a legal argument. So it's an interesting mistake rather than just a mistake. Yeah, yeah. I get it now completely, but yeah, and I, I will try to replicate this in order to see if, if, whether whether it it does this i could one explanation could be my prompting i was very forceful with prompting in the sense that i asked it to act as a judge and then i kind of insisted on a solution but my insistence was basically based on the non liquid idea the prohibition of non liquid in law i wanted it to reach a conclusion even if it doesn't have because and it seems to me a situation in which a judge is always in, so even if you can't kind of deductively reach a decision, uh, you still have to reach a decision with the things that you have, and by taking into account probably these burdens of proof or, or uh, rules about burdens of proof in a, in a legal system, but I, I will try to, to, and I wasn't thinking to tell you the truth about the, this possibility, but I will try to, to kind of see if this is the case or it just reacted kind of to my very, uh, like, um, authoritative prompts and so on. Thank you. Can I just uh, add a couple of more remarks? Uh, as you can see, this goes back to, to what you said, Burkhardt, uh, previously about uh, uh, learning how to play football from a very complex uh, uh, situation. This is completely uh, the most basic uh, situations that we, be that we actually do with our students. So this is how we learn them, to uh, uh, teach them to... to uh, 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 to, legal, uh, to reason legally. And so the let us not forget what was the the the, the overall idea to see whether uh, the capability of the AI is to provide something which is uh, which can be labeled as a type of legal reasoning in comparison to to ordinary reasoning. And I think that this even this. Uh, uh, example that you mentioned, uh, this situation in which uh, you have a, a kind of a, the provision stating reasonable, reasonable driving. So I would say that the ordinary reasoning probably of our students would be if nobody was hurt, then it was good enough. 90 kilometers was good enough. But that's kind of a, a consequential reasoning, which is not the type of legal reasoning we are interested in. Actually, we are trying some sort of ex ante uh, definition of what is reasoning, having in mind that it is populated area that it might be uh, heard. But so this is what we get here at, as a as a as a response, uh, which is a kind of a, a subtlety which shows us that there is uh, already enough of the training of the machines to act as if they are uh, reason uh, legally. Whether this will, uh, and I'm, I'm just, uh, I don't share this optimism with uh, with Boyan with respect to the... Uh, humans. Yeah, no, I, I, essentially, uh, the more complex, the more hard is the case that we are moving to, I don't know, the, the involvement of principles or whatever, you will, you will need you will need an adequate uh, uh, prompt. You will need to start with something. This goes also to what Masha was uh, explaining. What counts as a legally valid fact? So there are no, uh, not every kind of uh, uh, thing that that was there in the in the in the uh, circumstantial uh, uh, in the in the circumstances of the case count eventually as a as a valid fact. And this obviously. Uh, can be important for the for the final decision. So, I think that it it is a good uh, way to start from more simpler things, just to uh, because 
our intuition is always to try to uh, think defensively and to show what is the problem with the AI. We we just uh, use completely opposite opposite approach from the scratch, and that's uh, why our overall conclusions are not uh, you know like far-reaching. But I think that. Uh, we just made a, a, this simple point that we wanted to show. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> and with this, the first session of this two, uh, second day of the conference is closed. I think that we can just immediately pass to the second session yeah. of the day. So, please. Well, I remain here. <laughs> but, and you remain yeah. here. And yeah. Farin, you need to come and yeah.